number 16. I almost said number 16. I realized it's going to say number 16 for me. So, yeah, that's the official announcement that number 16 is Charles Cross. And this is a guy where you kind of expected he would step in and be the starter right away since you draft him in the top 10. You yeah. know, he's spending a pick like that. You need help uh, on the offensive line. He comes in. He starts a left tackle. Brady, I was stunned. I had to go back and look to make sure he played all but two snaps last yeah. year. That's a lot. That's a lot of wear and tear on a body. That's thoroughly impressive that Charles Cross with that durable all but two snaps. So you plug in a rookie and all of a sudden he's your anchor at left tackle. Doesn't miss any time. Thoroughly reliable. So now what's next for Charles Cross? How do you go from just being reliable to being a legitimate offensive weapon out there? I mean, I think he's got pro bowl, all pro potential. And you know, look, when you draft a guy in the top 10, like they did, uh, that's what you're hoping for. And I have seen nothing to dissuade uh, that thought from him. Now, last year, um, he was, I think he ranked third in ESPN's pass block win rate among rookies. Actually, the number two guy was Abe Lucas at right tackle. Hmm. Uh, but so he was ahead of the two other uh, offensive tackles that went before him, Evan Neal uh, and Ekem uh, Okwanu. I think I'm saying his name right. But, um, you know, and if you go back to week two, remember that, that conversation uh, with the Seahawks about how, you know, even though they lost that game at San Francisco and their offense was shut out, Remember, Pete Carroll said that they saw enough uh, from Geno and the offense to really open things up and to no longer hold Geno Smith back. Part of that was they felt like their young tackles, Charles Cross and Abe Lucas, they, they felt like they could trust those guys to hold up in pass protection against if they could do it against San Francisco and Bosa and the best defensive line that they were going to see all season. Uh, they felt like they could do it against anybody. So those guys, my point being there, came in, made a really strong impression right away. Um, you know, the other day where I was out there at Seahawks practice watching the one on one pass rush drill, which you ever out there, that is the one thing you have to watch. I saw Daryl Taylor put this wicked spin move uh, on Charles Cross and Charles Cross like did not bat an eye. He adjusted to it. He stayed with Daryl Taylor. It, it was I mean, Daryl Taylor is has one of the most explosive, you know, first steps uh, of any player in the NFL. And then he combined that with a spin move. And to just see a, a 300 plus pound guy, 6'3", 6'4", whatever Charles Cross is, move like that, uh, you think, okay, that's why te- that's why left tackle is such a premium position. That's why the Seahawks spent a top 10 pick on Charles Cross last year. Uh, guys that move that well, that quick, that powerfully, they're just rare. And Charles Cross has all the physical tools. So I think, uh, I think a legitimate possibility for him taking that jump from year one to year two is can he be a pro bowl guy i think that's entirely within reason he's got the physical tools he showed last year that it wasn't too big for him he showed he could be durable playing all but two snaps over a 17 game season playing in the trenches that's pretty remarkable so he's got everything you're looking for in a left tackle and i I think he's got pro bowl all pro potential and there was another thing that pete carroll liked about him and this was after the niners game uh, in december that one here that what thursday night game yeah 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 that thursday night game that uh pete carroll liked about charles cross after that one kind of liked it uh, it looked like charles got kind of pissed off a little bit last night yeah he's real quiet and i i I liked that he was bad i think somebody knocked his helmet off or whatever yeah and he got after a little bit that's going to come and there's there's a whole nother a whole other dimension to their their confidence and their their ability as they're growing that's going to show up and be a big part of what's, what's... you know yeah and, and and when you think about abe lucas on the right side remember that one of the big stories uh, one of the, the cool storylines from last preseason was abe lucas was pancaking guys driving guys into the dirt showing that nastiness that you think of when you think of right tackles especially some of the right tackles seattle has had in the past uh and yeah that is that to your point that is an interesting kind of next step for you know, a specific part of the evolution of his game is does some of the nastiness come out when you talk to Charles Cross, or at least I remember from last year talking to him, really quiet, really reserved guy, uh, would not say a whole lot, not, not wasn't surly by any means, but uh, just was kind of, kind of a to himself guy. And I wonder if you start, we'll start to see some of the personality come out in year two, now that he has had a year under his belt in the NFL. Um, and I wonder if some of the the nastiness will start to come out in him. And that feels important, especially in this division, when you're going to yeah. go up against a guy like Nick Bosa, who by all metrics, right, is probably the best edge rusher in the NFL. I think your uh, 
your colleagues there. We had Jeremy Fowler on. Remember yeah. last time you were in here and he ranked Nick Bosa in that list as the best edge rusher in the NFL this season. And last year certainly stood up there. So if you're going to face Nick Bosa two to three times a year, it feels like you're going to need some of that nastiness to counter back with. Totally. And it's Nick Bosa, it's Armstead, it's Aaron Donald and you know everybody. Like this is a, a division that's got a lot of top end pass rushers. And you know when you're playing San Francisco, the most physical team in the division, uh, some of that, you know, you're going to have to play like that in order to win. You, you just saw San Francisco kind of outlast Seattle. You know, a couple of those games were kind of close until the second half and, and San Francisco, just the physicality won out uh, over the course of a game over 60 minutes. And um, I'm curious to see what that looks like out of Seattle this season. I'm curious to see what that looks like out of Charles Cross. Is, does he have kind of that extra gear that you saw from Abe Lucas last year. Uh, you mentioned that he was second among rookies in pass block win rate, not among top 10 overall. So do you think he could jump into that? And I guess quickly, you can kind of refresh what that means because that's an ESPN metric used yeah. to judge uh, defensive linemen, offensive linemen. So from the offensive line standpoint, how is that calculated? Yeah, so it's pass block win rate. So that measures uh, the frequency at which an offensive lineman uh, sustains his block for at least 2.5 seconds or longer. 2.5 seconds might sound kind of arbitrary, but they, you know, did a bunch of studies and, and basically felt like that's that's a key number in terms of how long the quarterback should have to throw the ball. Um, and so 2.5 seconds, uh, you're, you're just looking at how often they sustain their block for that long. And that I think it's a, it's a cool stat because it it works to differentiate pressure and sacks that result from a faulty blocking or B the quarterback mm -hmm. just holding the ball too long. And, you know, it's just not realistic to expect an offensive lineman to sustain his block for five seconds. And so this really well, is sort of about that discrepancy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So this that stat kind of uh, it, it works to separate, to differentiate pressure. That's re that's the fault of the blocker versus the fault of the quarterback. Now, what about uh, run block win rate? I guess we're looking at the offense line as a whole now, because in that comprehensive look back at 2022 team run block win rate, the Seahawks are 24th in the league. Kind of surprising. Yeah considering that they ran the ball pretty well last season, at least in spurts, at least while their backfield was healthy. I, I don't have the numbers on cross um, in front of me, but yeah, that that number does seem kind of low for how well they ran the ball by and large last year. Do you think that's where a okay, year two Lucas cross, you get maybe a more experienced center in here or you know, a rookie that they're high on. Is that where that can build up and that number? Do you think that number will take a big leap forward for the Seahawks? I would imagine so. Yeah. When you talk about, um, just the, the fact that they, well, I say this right now and one of their running backs is hurt, but uh, you know, part of what you saw late last season when Geno Smith kind of ran into that, that rough patch uh, in December was remember that was when Ken Walker was hurt. And I, I feel like Geno uh, put too much, tried to put too much on himself. You were seeing him play maybe a little more aggressively than he and Pete Carroll would like. And I wonder if part of that was, you know, they didn't have Ken Walker there. The run game was struggling. Um, and so the idea with having Charbonnet there is that you've got, if one guy goes down, you should still be well set. Your backfield should not, you know, take that, should not fall off that way. And that should help Gino, uh, you know, when you're missing both guys, that conversation goes out the window. But by and large, yeah, I, I think that their run game should be better this year. Um, because it should be deeper. All right, that is our most intriguing Seahawks countdown. That was number 16, Charles Cross. So number 15 coming up on Monday.